Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here, and I, A, I apologize for the very late time of this video, and B, I apologize that I'm not live streaming this. Um, unfortunately, things have been very chaotic around here, and the leak of this, which probably this was intended to come out tomorrow, but because of some shenanigans that came out today, uh, totally screwed my schedule, so unfortunately I can only just now get around to it. And I'm having a couple of little issues with some of my stream stuff, so I decided to be better safe than sorry and record my reaction and talking about everything in this video. That way everyone can have it at the same time and I don't have to worry about like weird stuff hap happening. And I also, uh, as a last little thing, um, there may be little tears in reality. Um, just ignore them. My uh, my dear dog Chloe for some reason is sticking very close to my chair and she <laughs> likes to use the green screen as a blanket so if something weird happens over here just ignore it. Anyway, let's go ahead and dive into the trailer. Um, as per usual, I'm going to go ahead and watch it through once without um, talking just so I can kind of absorb what happens on the screen and then um, we will then break down the video. If past videos are anything to go by, this is only a three minute trailer, which means probably only like two and a half of it is actual footage, and this is probably still gonna be a 30 minute video. So anyway, I hope you all enjoy. Let's have a great time with this and check out Trial by Fire. Crank up that audio. Oh, my ears blown out. Geese live. All right. Ooh, we got the Aurora Borealis, which is not a good thing in fantasy. That means chaos is on the wind. The motherland has turned her back on us. Exiled to a wasted land. Brothers and sisters betrayed. Whilst okay. the meek cling to power. Is it just... Oh. Ooh, new Chaos Lord looks good. To be the bulwark the world relies on? Does it make us weak? To witness endless loss? Oh, okay, that dude's corrupted. Oh, look! Oh, dude, that... He kind of looks more Do badass with the helmet off. Damn. We are molded by it. Forged hot against an anvil of ice. What is that? Rage consumes us. Oh, dude. But from the fire. We rise again. Ah, oh, I love the corruption of that dude. I wonder if that'll be a mechanic. Ice bear! Taking us, bear friend. Oh. Hey, corn! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Don't follow bears; they will lead you to the literal gates of hell. Apparently. Uh. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, a fantastic trailer. Um. Wow. I think that's actually one of the better faction trailers that they've done though i honestly can't tell you if that was a kislev trailer or a corn trailer it was kind of both um i i i think i would say it was a corn trailer except for we didn't get to see any corn special characters oh we, we did get katarin though so maybe in that case it's a kislev trailer 
I will say, probably the only thing I did not like about this trailer is that we don't get any actual lines or talk from Katarin. Um, I actually would have really liked to hear her uh, be involved a little bit in the dialogue of the trailer. But, let's break this down. There is actually a lot to talk about in this trailer. It's not very long, but they also stuffed some really interesting things into an itty bitty space. So, let's go ahead and break this down. Um, practically frame by frame. And let's turn down the volume a lot. So, the first thing we start with is that we see this young man who's got a bear buddy. And they seem to be wandering north. I don't know why those two are by themselves. Perhaps the bear is representing Urson in a almost literal sense. But, you know, in a spiritual sense as well. And is leading this young man on a pilgrimage north. But here we have our Kislevite army. Uh, we go ahead and get a look at some earth. And this looks to be a minor settlement. Looks very, very cool. I love the, the Urson statue. But looks like we've got some winged lancers. Uh, some great axe infantry. Uh, and then some bear cav. This guy looks like he's kind of by himself. So probably a character on an armored bear. Doesn't look to be a part of the unit. Oh, okay, so let's actually talk about this guy's speech really quick. So, he starts off by saying the motherland has turned her back on us, which seems to me to indicate that, uh, well, let's, let's listen to his speech a bit again and then kind of break it down. Because I think this guy's speech could actually be secretly revealing a mechanic, but at the very least is a really good opening to talk about a really big lore thing uh, lore struggle that Kislev has that we as the players may have to deal with. So he starts off by saying that Motherland has turned her back on us, Motherland being Kislev itself. Exiled to a wasted land. So, exiled to a wasted land could mean one of two things in my mind that could have significantly different interpretations. When he says wasted land, it's very obvious that he's talking about the chaos waste, which means they've gone north. Um, we know that this game revolves around uh, the realm of chaos. And, oops, we still have alerts on. Turn those off. Um, so it is very likely that uh, these guys have been sent north. But this is the second time he's basically indicated a betrayal of some sorts, which I don't think is a coincidence, and we'll get into that. Brothers and sisters betrayed. Was the meek cling to power? Is it just? Let's give ahead a little bit to when he talks again. To be the bulwark the world relies on? Does it make us weak? Endless loss. Do we falter? No. We are molded by it. God, they look so good. Forged. Against an anvil of ice. Rage consumes us. But from the fire, we rise again. Okay, so that's enough to talk about this guy's deal. Um, I, I think this man being our kind of main character next to the young man is not a coincidence. So let's talk about what's happening, because I think there's actually a lot being... There's a story being told here that a lot of people are going to miss. And I want to break it down because I think it's actually super interesting and super important. And, you know, I imagine most of you come here for lore more than anything else. So, this guy is clearly a general. Someone very, very high up in Kislevite society and in the ranks of the military. So, something that's important to know about Kislev is that Kislev's culture, Kislev's society, is actually two different cultures that have, over time, been kind of bound together. And that those are the Gospodars, 
which are like the ruling elite. They are the more urban culture. They live in a lot of the cities. They're your nobles. They have a lot of political power. They lead your armies. They're the ones who tend to make up the elite units because they have the gear and the training. Um, so they're often your like your Griffin Legion or your Winged Lancers, your Zar Guard, all those kinds of guys. And then you have the Ungols. And the Ungols are like the peasants. They are a rural folk. They're much more tribalistic and traditional and old-fashioned. And they make up, well, the Ungols. They are, you know, they make up like your Ungol horse archers, your Ungol infantry. Um, they're kind of like, you could kind of think of them almost like Imperial State Troops or Bretonian peasants. But, you know, they're much more skilled in combat than Bretonian peasants. But the interesting thing is there's a big clash between these cultures. And that is that you basically have the Gospodars making all the laws and the rules and deciding all the important stuff. And they kind of lord over the Ungols who ignore or try to ignore a lot of these laws and try and stay unbound by Kislev as a whole and kind of just try to mind their own business. But you know as time has carried on this has been harder and harder to do and has caused a lot of strife between these two cultures but then something changed and that change was Katarin so Katarin the the ice queen of Kislev decided that she was not okay with the situation anymore Katarin came in and decided that she wanted to unify Kislev proper. But she knew to do that was going to be difficult because of two main reasons. One, the Ungols are not really interested in adopting a lot of Kislev's lore, uh, laws and strictures because they feel trampled upon and they don't, like they, you cannot, before Katarin, you legally could not essentially become a noble or anyone with any genuine power if you were an Ungol. At best, you could be like the tribe of your local chief or something, or tri chief of your local tribe <laughs> or something, but that's about it. Katarin decided to change that. So she came in and she started going out to all the Ungol tribes and trying to bring them into the fold to really convince them that they are Kislevites. And while they can be proud of their heritage as Ungols, they should unify with the whole. They should adopt the laws of Kislev. They should be identify as Kislevites and fight alongside Kislevites. And as part of that, she started very cleverly using politics to attack the old structures of Kislev and try to bring in Ungols in the fold. Because Katarin believes that authority should be given to those who earn it. That power should be given to those who demonstrate the ability to wield it effectively. That your ability as a general or a leader or a lawmaker or whatever should be determined by your past deeds, by your accomplishments, not by your blood. That there is no birthright to power. It is earned, not given. And... There is a huge group that was super not okay with this. The Gospodars. Because the Gospodars had family lines as most of the ways that you would become a big ruler. For them, power was a family right. It was your heritage. And Katarin started to disrupt that. And it caused a lot of turmoil within Kislev. And was potentially even brooding towards civil war... Uh, before Kislev kind of fell into the background and then, you know, the end times happened and all that. But now we're back. And I think that this gentleman, our our bare armor old man general who looks very wealthy, very powerful, this is a Gospodar. This is a man who has always had power, had power given to him. He believes it is his right. He believes that because of the oceans of blood he shed, and no matter what he does, that he deserves to be top dog, I bet he got kicked out. 
I bet that this is one of those people who was very traditional, who thinks that the Gospodar should be in charge and that the Ungol should live under their boots, and that Katarin exiled him. Which is why he starts going on about this speech of the motherland. Kislev has betrayed me. I've been exiled by my country, my people. He gets forced to go north. Katarin kicks him out. He His pretty much only option is to go north. And he starts reflecting. He, he gets angry. He's been betrayed so that the meek, the, the weak peasants, these little, little ants are now being given power, being treated fairly, where he should rule, where the powerful, the gospodars, the rightful heirs should rule. And I think this is further reinforced by when he talks about this. Brothers and sisters betrayed. So he's talking about brothers and sisters betrayed. Once again, kind of using family-like language. And I think once more he's talking about the Gospodars, that the ruling Italy, and granted, I could be totally off base here, but let me fully explain my little story here about his dialogue, and y'all let me know if you think I'm crazy or not. So, he's talking about brothers and sisters, you know, the people that he associates with have been betrayed and had their back turned on them by Katarin. But then the, here's, the, here's the key line. Was the meek cling to power? So the entire time he says that, we're only looking at Ungols. So we're only looking at these folk, the rural peasants of Kislev, the people who have been left behind for thousands of years by no matter how far Kislev advances because the Gospodars refuse to acknowledge them as e their fellow man, refuse to acknowledge them as equals. So this guy gets kicked out. And he starts reflecting about how unfair it all is. How no matter how much he gives, no matter how much he has suffered, Katarin, this, this child, this upstart, has come onto the throne with the disappearance of Tsar Boris, and she's changing things. She kicks him out because he refuses to get with the program. He's too warlike. He's too bloodthirsty. He's too cruel. So he goes north into the waste and he starts suffering even more. And as he's losing his people, he's losing his, you know, those who have stayed loyal to him, that are stayed under his name, that are related to him. Um, he starts losing all these allies and he starts reflecting on how unfair it all is. That Kislev is the bulwark against chaos. That his people, his line, has been forced to shed their blood, suffer, and be caught in this endless cycle of violence and despair while everyone else gets to just reap the benefits from that including the empire Britonia, all those southern kingdoms of weak men with bountiful harvests and beautiful landscapes and nearly not as many problems they don't have to face the hordes of chaos practically on a yearly basis they don't have to face unspeakable horrors and deadly winters and he starts getting angry and the angrier he gets, the more he starts drawing the attention of Korn, and the more it starts to feed into him until he literally becomes corrupted. He literally, we don't get to of course see what all happens, but we can tell that he has gone down this, down this dark path where he abandons his armor, he starts wearing the chaos armor of Korn, his flesh starts to mutate, he's got raw power of chaos pouring through his veins. Is it just? You know, and he gives in to despair. He gives in, to, well, he gives in to rage, not despair, otherwise this would be a Nurgle video. But he gives in to that, what he believes is a justified anger, a justified rage. And he thinks it's only natural that Korn's fiery wrath, Korn's burning hate, hammering against Kislev over and over and over is what produces his people. That it is only natural, it is only the, you know, the... the right of the fittest, the strongest to go through. But I think what's really key about this video is that the entire time this guy's going on and on and on about how unfair everything is and how Kislev has betrayed him and the motherland's turned his back on him and that the Kislevites are doomed to become monsters because theirs is the life of the cold anvil that gets beaten until it eventually gives in to this raging fire. We have this young man. And this young man who's traveling with the bear companion 
is going on some kind of journey. Now, whether he was part of this guy's army and they got cut off somehow, and maybe he found this bear who's leading him, or maybe he's simply just a folk of the Ungol who is very faithful to Ursin and has a bear companion who leads him on a journey that's unrelated to these guys, it's unclear to say. But we do see that this young man who is just an Ungol archer, like he's literally the most basic of the basic tier people in Kislev, starts finding this guy's army as they go further and further into the Chaos Waste. So this guy's leaving, he's marching out, and we hear, see here now they're in the Chaos Waste. And we know they're in the Chaos Waste because there's literally a giant portal to the Realm of Chaos just sitting there right in the middle of nowhere. So uh, if you see one of these, you, you probably should go south real quick. To a wasted land, brothers and sisters betrayed. Was the meek cling to bow. So it looks like this young man is this kid right here. So it looks like he is maybe be maybe having memories of some allies or just his people while this guy's mouthing off about him. Is it just He begins his self-reflection, and here we see him post-transformation when he's become a Chaos Lord. We see some Zar Guard here going, uh-oh. And here's another interesting thing. So right with this jump scare, uh, forward. So we get this jump scare of what looks like a bloodthirster. So we get a bloodthirster jump scare, and then there's all these crows. Now the interesting thing is these crows could they could just be birds. I'm totally admitting that these could just be regular birds doing regular stuff because there's like dead bodies and stuff, and that's totally fair. However, something I do think is maybe not a coincidence, unless they're just trying to recycle assets, these aren't just birds. These are the exact same crow models used by the Zinch Demon in Total War Warhammer 1 and 2. These are the exact same bird we see traveling around with the advisor before he gets offed. And, um, or sorry, Total War Warhammer 1. He's not in Total War Warhammer 2, technically. But it's literally the exact same bird model the only difference being that they maybe are black instead of white but could be a coincidence or it could be maybe the advisor is involved in this somehow maybe that dude um who may well have died or maybe you know there's a demon pretending to be him uh was involved in all these shenanigans somehow or maybe this is just like hey zinch is next who knows there's your crackpot theory for this video but let's continue on following the narrative so here the young man is abandoned by the bear um, the bear basically gets so focused that it runs off while he's seemingly reminiscing uh, about his people or those he's lost. And I think at this point, we're meant to draw a narrative difference between this young man and um, the old man, the, the Gospodar and then this Ungol. And I think this young man has been abandoned by his bear companion and we're going to see that he's kind of like, ugh, especially when the forest catches on fire, and he kind of has a moment where he has to make a decision. He decides to go after Urson, to go after the bear, and not give up hope, not give up faith, and goes after it. And follows it into the literal hellscape of the Realm of Chaos, whereas our other fellow, who finds himself on that crossroad between faith and, dis and rage... Instead, gives into rage. I think these two are actually meant to be paralleled. To be the bulwark the world relies on. Like this young man gets to make a choice. Also, cool model here that I caught. Look at this guy. So this, I think, is a new hero type. I think this is a exalted champion of corn. So we have exalted champions in Total War Warhammer 1 for the Warriors of Chaos, um, which are the hero level of the, like, Chaos Lord, I think this is the Cornate version. Um, because it doesn't look at all like the old man. Um, it's got, this dude's got, like, a massive beard, and he's got both eyes, he doesn't have any scars. Um, this looks like it's probably just the, the hero level Cornate champion model, especially because he's wearing so little armor, um, and doesn't have a helmet. He almost has more of a marauder vibe, like someone who's very up and coming, but not nearly at the top of the echelon. Um, of course, he is holding a skull and he's got a very big, cool thematic uh, corn head behind him. Um, but he is riding a chaos steed. Like, he's riding a chaos steed of corn. 
Um, hopefully they have fixed the proportions of the Chaos Steeds, so they're actual horses now, are like big heavily armored Chaos Steeds, and they're no longer Chaos Ponies. Um, that is something I dearly, dearly hope for. But uh, let's keep going. So he gets corrupted, he gives in to rage, and just a beautiful model he turns into. Honestly, I kind of prefer him without the helmet. Um, like, the helmet's cool looking, don't get me wrong, but seeing, like, all of the, like, red veins in his head from all the power flowing through him, and, uh, like, his eyes have turned red and everything, he just looks great. Do we falter? And here's the thing. He says, do we falter, but he's talking about it in the sense of, do I give in to weakness? And, uh, which, in his mind, I think weakness is very distorted. Uh, because he says, no, you know, we give in to rage and turn into abominations. Th but he says it while this kid is thinking. This kid could track the bear, or he could run away. Um, he could give in to some other emotion. But this kid doesn't falter. I think the narrator, the uh, old man, does falter. At least in a spiritual sense. So he starts burning down Kislevite cities and homes, and we see that that fire is reflected in that this forest in the Chaos Wastes, uh, presumably if the kid has continued going north, bursts into flames, which is likely signifying a border to a different realm. We are molded by it. And here we go. Let's talk about some actual juicy unit reveals here. We've got Chaos Warhounds. Here on the front line. Those are not flesh hounds. Those are definitely not flesh hounds. Um, we, we do see them also later in the trailer, but they, they don't. Like, they've got like fur, and they're clearly the uh, Chaos Hound models, and they got like those bone spikes and everything coming out of their faces, but they don't have the big reptilian frills that flesh hounds have. Plus, I think flesh hounds will be bigger than this. Um, here we've got Blood Crushers of Corn. Which we've already seen Skull Crushers. Skull Crushers we saw in the first uh, cinematic trailer. Skull Crushers are mortal champions of corn, So like Chaos Warriors. Who are on top of Juggernauts. Which are these big old rhino things. Whereas Blood Crushers are demons of corn On top of um, um, Juggernauts. So we've got both versions. Which is awesome. So we're going to have two types of heavy cav. I'm not exactly sure how they'll be different. Um, but I'm sure there will be some notable difference. It, you know, it's funny. It's actually very easy to see where blood letters are in the armies because they have these huge flaming swords. So you can identify them like a mile away. Um, here we've got, looks like, Chaos Furies, which we've also seen in some of the promotional footage. So we've got Furies, uh, Chaos Furies flying through the sky. And so far we've got Chaos Warriors of Corn with two twin axes. Um, I really, really love their armor and the fact that their axes are, like, flaming hot, like, molten hot. Here we've got, uh, up close blood letters who look absolutely monstrous and fantastic. I love their design. They look great. Um, the Warriors of Corn look better than they ever have. They look absolutely fantastic. So we see... Bear Cav! You know what's funny about these Bear Cav to me? Does anyone else think that, like, don't get me wrong, they look amazing, I can't wait for them to get tabletop models in Warhammer the Old World, but, like, the guy on top of the bear, is he really gonna do anything? <laughs> like, like, to me, it really feels like this dude is wish wishful thinking. <laughs> you know, he's like, my, my spear will maybe get a kill maybe two <laughs> meanwhile my heavily armored war bear that is going to just absolutely plow through everything else um but yeah very very excited to see uh the bear cav in action and here is probably the most interesting clip in the entire video for me personally um it should not be a secret i think by now that me and many other content creators did have a opportunity to play total war warhammer 3 a battle um uh, which you will probably see some goodies about tomorrow. Um, but the uh, I have no idea what this is. Uh, so I, like, I've seen a fair amount of these things. Like these, um, because I thought these were winged lancers at first, but they are so heavily armored and so richly adorned and they've got twin frills instead of just one. Or I don't know what these, I don't know what this thing is called, but they've got two instead of just one. Um, I think these are, these are probably the Griffin Legion. 
um, which the Griffin Legion are basically like the elite of the Winged Lancers. They're heavily armored Winged Lancers. So you can kind of think of them as like your Grail Knights as opposed to your Knight of the Realm, if that makes sense. Or your... Yeah, yeah that's probably the best comparison. But that wolf thing? Or cat? I don't know what that is. But that ice... I, it look, I, I think I'm going to go with wolf, even though the ears are almost like too narrow and pointed up. And it's almost got like a beard made of ice. Or that's got like ice magic around it. It almost has more of like a feline look to it than dog or wolf but regardless i have no idea what that is literally no idea if i had to guess it is probably an elemental spirit we do of course see the elemental bear at the end of the trailer which we'll talk about in a little while but i'm guessing it's some kind of elemental spirit or maybe someone transformed into it um it's worth noting that um so the thing that's so confusing about it is that there are three gods, primary gods of Kislev. Those are Ursin, the bear god, Tor, the god of storms and thunder, and Draz, who's the god of fire, um, to make it simple. He has a lot of association with the sun, but you can primarily think of him as the god of fire. And those are the big three. However, Kislev has a very deep relationship with um, Ulrich, the wolf god, the god of winter, the god of battle from the Empire. Because in, in kind of like ancient times, Ulrich was probably the most popular god of humanity um, in the old world. So Sigmar worshipped Ulrich. Many of the ancestors of the Kislevites uh, worshipped Ulrich. Um, and of course, almost the entirety of the Empire worshipped Ulrich. Um, except for maybe those people that were in like the southern areas of the Empire. But Ulrich is like very, very big deal among the old gods. And he is very, very popular in Kislev. He is very much seen as a brother god to Ursin, the bear god and the wolf god, um, both of whom have a lot of tie-ins with winter um, and ice, are very considered very close, and their religions are very close. So maybe this is some kind of like priest of Ulrich that transformed, or it's like a elemental summon or something, because um, it's got ice magic around it, which to me indicates that it's a magical entity. But it's got so much, like, jewelry and stuff that it almost feels like someone intentionally decorated it before it was sent off into war. But it's writing by itself. That's the thing that gets me and really confused. Is that it's clearly not a unit or a monster. Because it is big. You know, it's, like, almost the size of a dude on a horse. But it... It's not a unit. It's literally just an individual. So it's like a hero of some kind or something. I don't know. I literally don't know. Um... But uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to the Elemental Bear. Us. So here we've got the two armies charging at each other. Um, but honestly, it's kind of easier to see everything that's going on once we zoom in. Closer. So here we've got all sorts of lovely high tier infantry. Looks like maybe we've got Zargard. Uh, we've got some like shield, sword and board. We've got a bunch of dudes with swords and shields. And then we got these dudes. Uh, it looks like you can see two hands gripping these big... They have curved swords! Curved swords! But they've got these big old two-handed swords. Uh, it looks like they're dual wielding them. So maybe it's like a, a great weapon variant of the Zargard. Or perhaps um, it's a great weapon variant of the Kossars. I'm not sure which. Um, but here we've got the, uh, the, the delightful Stretzi with their big old... Uh, great weapons. They're, they're two-handed axes, um, which uh, I can't wait for y'all to see what, what all they do. Um, and actually, we know there are skull cannons of corn on the battlefield. If you look in the back, you see these flashes of cannons firing on the from these large shadowy figures, and those must be skull cannons. The only artillery owned by Chaos, unless they decide to get really weird with it, um, the only normal um, artillery is from Korn, which are his skull cannons. Which skull cannons are these... They they look like chariots with two blood letters on them. One is kind of operating a gun and the other one kind of like steers it, but they're both more busy stabbing people. But the chariot they're riding on is not actually a chariot, it's a demon. Um, but it's a demon that like, it has this big old chomp chomp mouth on the front and then it's got a fleshy cannon on top and what it does is it devours skulls, or it's fed skulls, um, that not only allow it to regenerate, 
but also provide it fuel because it takes in the skulls of the unworthy and jazzes them all up with chaos energy and fire and then spits them out of the cannon mouth. And if you get hit by that, your day is done. Like, you're wrecked. And we know that it's artillery fighting at the Kislevites because immediately here in a second we're going to see the Kislevites flying everywhere. And, uh, man, look at all those Chaos Furies. That is a lot of Chaos Furies. Which, Furies are one of the weakest types of demons. But the advantage they have for being very, very weak is that they're very light and they're airborne. Um, they can fly. And they're very dangerous for, like, a normal human in close combat. But from the fire, we rise again. I love how his voice changes. Now, so here we go. I keep hitting the wrong buttons. But from the fire, we rise again. All right, so here's a great clip. So we've got the Ice Guard, the Ice Guard of the Tsarina herself going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Warrior of Chaos. The Ice Guard, of course, have those badass ice spears um, that have ice magic bound into them. And they also have bows. They're like the um, Sisters of Avalorn from the High Elf roster where they have, they have magical bows, but instead of shooting fire, they shoot ice at you. Um, but they're also spear halberdish infantry instead of the Sisters of Avalorn who are more range-focused. And here we've got two other variants of the Warriors of Chaos. We see right here in the center, we've got a Axe and Shield bro. Whoop, 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 whoop. Uh, we've got an Axe and Shield bro. Uh, and we've also got a Halberd. Or maybe it's a great weapon, but it looks like a Halberd because of the way it's like spiked. And like just the sheer length on that thing. Like I think it's a Halberd. Could be a great weapon though. And then, oh, we get a Juggernaut up close. Look at this thing. So Juggernauts are very, very cool creatures. They are fusions of demon flesh, machine, and just pure molten rage. And they're almost these Saurian rhinoceros creatures that are mostly made out of metal. Because, I mean, look at this thing's rear leg. It's, it's almost robotic, right? You can see, like, all, like, the rivets and bolts and um, you got, like, these little tubes like, you can tell it's mostly metallic, but then you've got some fleshy bits and all these teeth. Um, and this, uh, man, I would not want one of those things coming up behind me. Um, like this lady has. You're about to get eight. So we see our young man here starts panicking. While we've got these. And here you can see these dogs from earlier. You can tell they're clearly Chaos Warhounds. They're very furry. Um, and they're, they're quite small in comparison to a human. And they've got, like, horns and stuff. But those are not flesh hounds. Flesh hounds would be much larger. Um, and not furry. And then we've got Katarin herself! The Ice Queen of Kislev marches to war. And she uses her magic to bring up a model that was leaked a little bit ago. But I'm very excited to see now. Which is the Elemental Bear. Which, one thing we're discussing about, and we're already way over time, so I'm going to try and summarize this quick. I, I have a video coming out about it in more in detail very soon. But, essentially, this ice bear and probably that elemental wolf from earlier represent... Oh, we got Bloodthirster! Bloodthirster! But the elemental bear is... Um, the elemental bear is essentially... So, the land... When it comes to the lore of ice magic, a lot of people get confused about it, and understandably so, because they look at the, like, the battle wizards for the Empire and then, like, the elves and stuff, and they're like, why does nobody else use ice magic? Like, the Empire has a wizard for all eight winds of magic, and yet no ice wizards. Um, the elves and the slon are, like, the big bad masters of magic. Still no ice magic. What's the deal with that? And the explanation is actually that... The lore of ice is not a naturally occurring wind of magic. The lore of ice is, um, to put it simply, it is the magic of Kislev itself. K Kislev, in many ways, is similar to Athel Lorien, where it is a land that, due to some stuff I don't have time for right now, is very deeply ingrained with ancient, powerful magics. And the way this magic is expressed is through the people of Kislev. The people, uh, the Ice Witches. Which the Ice Witches are natives who have learned to wield the magical, almost spiritual power of their land itself. They're not priests, they are wizards. But their power is utilizing this ancient lifeblood of Kislev itself as a weapon. 
And so whenever they're casting ice magic at you, they're essentially utilizing the power of Kislev, even if they're far away from it, to transform the very air, water, and earth around them and cover them in frost or harden them to frost or whatever and use that against you. And the ice bear and perhaps that wolf we saw earlier, but definitely the ice bear are, or the elemental bear, are a pure expression of this. They are a natural evolution. Which the Elemental Bearer is literally the land of Kislev itself rising up to fight invaders. It is the land becoming practically sentient and shambling itself together like a golem into the appearance, the approximation of a bear. And uh, as you can see, there's nothing natural, uh, there's nothing flesh about it. It is literally earth, ice, snow tree roots it's even got like actual trees sprouting out of its back like it's a freaking pokemon uh like torterra or something um like a world turtle almost um that charges into battle and that that bear is huge i mean you can see it here when the it charges at the uh when it and the bloodthirst are about to attack each other that bear so in this frame We've got the almost the entirety of this bloodthirster in frame. <laughs> like, he fits. The ice bear, we've got maybe half of its body. Like, these things are... I don't think they're quite as large as the Dreadsaurian, but they're in that ballpark. Like, they will dwarf the, like, Stegodons and Carnosaurs and Hydras of the world. Um, they are... They are big. Which is great. I love that Kislev has a super big um, elemental monster. It's great. And then the last thing we have to talk about is the end of the trailer. Which, if you've been paying attention to the battle footage, you probably know where this is. Um, we see that this bear has guided this young man to their true enemy. Where they need to be. Which is to the very doorstep of hell. Korn's Fortress. This isn't just the edge of the Realm of Chaos. No, no, no. We're way in the Realm of Chaos. This is the Brass Citadel. This is Korn's house. If you bust open those doors and you go inside, you will find Korn. And as we see, the god himself, Korn, is right there. <laughs> he's behind it. Um, he's big. And I gotta say, this image, this, this, per this frame is everything i so deeply love about warhammer fantasy captured perfect which is that okay i'm about to throw some shade but bear with me i do not know of another universe that i've learned of at least in fantasy but like warhammer 40k lord of the rings um even age of sigmar no other universe i think has this kind of showdown where or imagery where you have a man like just a kid practically but just a guy going up against a god you have the kislevites they're not superhuman they don't have a bunch of crazy futuristic bs organs they don't have super advanced technology they do not have the literal essence of a god fused into their form they don't have immortal life. They don't have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years to practice fighting and get their reaction speed down to a fraction of a millisecond and to like get super speed and super strength and super armor and super everything. They don't have any of those tricks and abilities. You know, they're just, they're just guys <laughs> and they're going up against the god of rage the most powerful deity in the fantasy universe and does that guy stand a chance against that god no not by himself but with faith and gunpowder and steel he stands a chance and i i love that about fantasy that i think the purest expression of it even though the humans of fantasy are not my favorite factions by any means you know i'm much more of like a beast man or lizardman kind of guy but or dwarfs but the humans don't have they're us you know they are they are interpretations and expressions of us our cultures our abilities um in a realm where magic exists and they get up and fight impossible odds because they're just bad ass 
And that is why Warhammer Fantasy, in my opinion, will always be the superior fantasy universe. Because it's just such a rare thing in other universes. Where, yeah, you know, sometimes they'll have help from, like, monsters and stuff. But ultimately, it's those three tenets that allow them to equalize the situation. And, of course, magic doesn't help, you know, when you have a wizard and stuff. Um, but I just love it. And I'm very, very excited for you all to see what's coming. So, um, that's going to be it for today's video. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. Once again, I apologize that it wasn't live streamed, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, most of which you will see very soon. So, I hope you can forgive me on this particular instance. This is why I don't like leaks. <laughs> leaks screw everything up. Um, and my schedule gets thrown into a freaking furnace. But, uh, thank you all so much for joining me. I hope there was a lot of interesting lore in this video, and I would love to know, um, of the things I talked about, do you think what I was talking about was crazy? Because, oh, the last thing I wanted to say is that the reason I went off about the whole thing about the Gospodars versus the Ungols, and that this guy is probably a pissed off, uh, Gospodar of the Old Order, and that this young man is like an Ungol in the New Rising Order, is I think it could be an actual mechanic. I think just like we have, uh, the Skaven and the Dark Elves where there's like a treachery mechanic, I think Kislev and maybe all the races in Warhammer 3 could have an advanced form of that. A new form that's better done. Which, imagine if you have, like, Gospodar Generals and you're playing as Katarin and you're trying to balance bringing Kislev into a new age while going to war with the Dark Gods and you have to deal with the potential corruption of your agents and generals. If your Gospodar General feels like he's not getting all the authority and power he deserves, if he's not being lavished upon, and you've sent him into the realm of chaos, and he's like constantly fighting and getting worn down and all this stuff, what if there's like a corruption meter where you have to worry about your generals and agents become or allies, like other allied factions, fighting against you because you're trying to be good and do the right thing, and they're getting pissed at you and giving in to corruption? So, like, if there's maybe, like, a corruption meter where you have to watch your generals. And if you're playing as the Demons of Chaos, say you're playing as Zinch, Korn, Slanesh, or Nurgle, maybe that's how you also affect some of these factions, is that you corrupt them. You're trying to corrupt the If you're playing as Korn, you're trying to turn this guy to your side. You're using your agents and maybe various mechanics to increase his corruption meter so that maybe he gives in. He gives in to all that rage and hatred and he joins your side and becomes a new Chaos Lord or something. But uh, yeah, so let me know what uh, part of the video y'all found the most interesting. What part of the video you thought... Uh, let me know if you think anything I talked about was complete BS and like tinfoil hat bullshit. Uh, or if you think that I'm like right on the money and like stuff or if you think things could be really exciting and all that. That's going to be it for me today. I will see you guys tomorrow. Big day. Bye guys.